welcome to the week of June 8th for Grade 7 ELA Lesson 1. For this lesson, we will take a look at some resources on the topic of consumerism and how it relates to happiness. But before we get started, a congratulations is in order. You've made it to the end of the unit writing activity. That means you're almost finished with this unit and with the school year. Great job hanging in there with adjusting to virtual distance learning. We all know it isn't easy, so the fact that you've stuck it out and made it this far is amazing. Take a minute to celebrate yourself. Okay, now calm down for a bit because there is still work to do. Here is your end of unit writing task. Throughout this unit, you have read many texts about consumerism and analyzed central ideas and supporting details. For this lesson, you will be reading information from two different sources that address the connection between owning, buying material things and happiness. Your job will be to determine and explain the message expressed by each source. Your job in the next lesson will be to write an essay that analyzes the messages in these two articles. So for this video segment, we will take a look at an additional resource that could be used in your writing assignment, or at least as a model for how to prepare for your writing task. Let's watch this TED Talk video in which Graham Hill shares his views on the connection between money and happiness. As you watch, think about what his central ideas are and the evidence he uses to support these ideas. What's in the box? Whatever it is, it must be pretty important because I've traveled with it, moved it from apartment to apartment to apartment. <laughs> <clears throat> Sound familiar? <laughs> Did you know that we Americans have about three times the amount of space we did 50 years ago? Three times. So you'd think with all this extra space, we had plenty of room for all our stuff, right? Nope. <laughs> There's a new industry in town, a $22 billion, 2.2 billion square foot industry, that of personal storage. So we've got triple the space, but we become such good shoppers that we need even more space. So where does this lead? Lots of credit card debt, huge environmental footprints, and perhaps not coincidentally, our happiness levels flatline over the same 50 years. Well, I'm here to suggest there's a better way, that less might actually equal more. I bet most of us have experienced at some point the joys of less. College, in your dorm, traveling in a hotel room, camping where you got basically nothing, maybe a boat. Whatever it was for you, I bet that among other things, this gave you a little more freedom, a little more time. So I want to suggest that less stuff and less space are going to equal a smaller footprint. It's actually a great way to save you some money, and it's going to give you a little more ease in your life. So I started a project called Life Edited at lifeedited.org to further this conversation and to find some great solutions in this area. First up, crowdsourcing my 420 square foot apartment in Manhattan with partners Mutopo and Javoto.com. I wanted it all. Home office, sit down dinner for 10, room for guests, and all my kite surfing gear. With over 300 entries from around the world, I got it, my own little jewel box. By buying a space that was 420 square feet instead of 600, immediately I'm saving 200 grand. Smaller space is gonna make for smaller utilities, save some more money there but also a smaller footprint. And because it's really designed around an edited set of possessions, my favorite stuff, and really designed for me, I'm really excited to be there. So how can you live little? Three main approaches. First of all, you need to edit ruthlessly. We've got to clear the arteries of our lives. That shirt that I haven't worn in years, it's time for me to let it go. We've got to cut the extraneous out of our lives and we've got to learn to stem the inflow. We need to think before we buy. Ask ourselves, is that really going to make me happier? Truly? 
by all means, we should buy and own some great stuff. But we want stuff that we're going to love for years, not just stuff. Secondly, our new mantra, small is sexy. We want space efficiency. We want things that are designed for how they're used the vast majority of the time, not that rare event. Why have a six burner stove when you rarely use three? So we want things that nest, we want things that stack, and we want to digitize. You can take paperwork, books, movies, and you can make it disappear. It's magic. Finally, we want multifunctional spaces and housewares. A sink combined with a toilet. A dining table becomes a bed, same space. A little side table stretches out to seat 10. In the winning life edited scheme in a render here, we combine a moving wall with transformer furniture to get a lot out of the space. Look at the coffee table. It grows in height and width to seat 10. My office folds away, easily hidden. My bed just pops out of the wall, two fingers. Guests move the moving wall, have some fold down guest beds. And of course, my own movie theater. So I'm not saying that we all need to live in 420 square feet, but consider the benefits of an edited life. Go from 3,000 to 2,000, from 1,500 to 1,000. Most of us, maybe all of us, are here pretty happily for a bunch of days with a couple bags, maybe small space, hotel room. So when you go home and you walk through your front door, take a second and ask yourselves, could I do with a little life editing? Would that give me a little more freedom? Maybe a little more time? What's in the box? It doesn't really matter. I know I don't need it. What's in yours? Maybe, just maybe, less might equal more. So let's make room for the good stuff. Thank you. Let's take a look at some of the points that were brought up in the video. This chart is the same as what you will use to organize the information in the articles you will read this week. First, we zero in on the central ideas, or in this case, we're looking at the connection between owning, buying material things, and happiness. Graham Hill makes two related points in his video. First, more stuff equals less happiness, more debt, more CO2 emissions. And going along with that, less is more. So he is trying to communicate to his audience that the fewer material things that you own or that you buy, the happier you will be. And he does this using some related evidence and explanation. First, he talks about how Americans have three times the amount of space as they did 50 years ago. So even though they have triple the space, they still need more space. He talks about the use of storage units and uh, the fact that we have larger homes, etc. He asks the listeners to consider when they have been somewhere where they had less space and less materials. So for example, when they're in a hotel room or when they're camping or maybe when they went to college and were in a college dorm. Those were all very small spaces for which you needed very few things. And he argues that that gave you freedom and time to do the things that you really enjoyed doing. So again, connecting to that idea that the, the less is more, that there's smaller spaces, fewer things, gave you more freedom and time. He uses his example of his own 420 square foot apartment and some of the things that he had to do and the creative use of his space and that by doing that he saved himself some money and he found that he was emitting less co2 so it was better for the environment and then he details the three steps that he feels people could follow if they want to live a happier life with fewer material possessions so he says to edit ruthlessly to really think about what you own and what you buy and whether you truly need it he says to think small, to consider what you're buying and how you might be able to minimize the impact that it has on your space. 
and then also make multifunctional. So think about ways that you could use one item for several different purposes. And he believes by doing all of these things, it will lead to more happiness because less is more. So all the evidence works together to support his argument that less is more, and he also serves to encourage the watcher or listener to change their habits and to increase their happiness. So now it's your turn. You will read two articles that express viewpoints on material things and happiness. As you read, you will annotate central ideas and the details that support those central ideas. And then after reading, you'll take those annotations and you will apply those notes to a chart that's very much like what we just did with the video. You'll notice that you have the same questions to answer, the connection between owning, buying material things and happiness, and then the evidence. And you'll complete that for each of the two articles. All of this will serve as a pre-write for your end of unit writing task, which you will complete in the next lesson in lesson two. Keep in mind that the work that we did with the video in this lesson could be used for that essay as well. So you could have um, a third resource that you could mention when you actually go to write your essay, but you do still wanna focus on these two articles so that you can collect some information from them. So good luck and happy reading. Hi there, and welcome to the week of June 8th, grade seven GT ELA, lesson two. In this lesson, we will focus on revising the allegory you drafted for your end of unit writing activity. Before we get started, a congratulations is in order. You have made it to the last step of the end of unit writing activity. That means you're almost finished with this unit and with the school year. Great job hanging in there and adjusting to the virtual and distance learning. We all know it isn't easy, so the fact that you've stuck it out and made it this far is amazing. Take a minute to celebrate yourself. Okay, now settle down because we got a little bit of work to do. Revising is an essential part of the writing process. It's one thing to get all of your ideas down in a draft, but it's another to refine those ideas to ensure that they are clearly and effectively communicated. In narrative writing especially, you want to ensure that you are engaging your reader in the narrative elements. Like Judy Bloom says, it's like connecting the pieces to a puzzle so that you have a clear picture by the end. In your lesson for this week, you were given these reminders for what your draft should include or achieve. A strong piece of narrative writing will have the following elements. Develops experiences or events using effective techniques, well-chosen details, and well-structured event sequences. Develops clear and coherent writing in which the development, organization, and style are appropriate to task, purpose, and audience. Is developed with effective narrative techniques and creates an effective progression of experiences or events includes a well-developed thematic or topical link to the sources, which enhances the narrative, uses precise words, telling details, and sensory language to convey a clear and vivid depiction of the experiences, events, setting, and or characters. We've done a lot of prep work on developing the characters and events. For this segment, we will look at a level up tutorial to help us with the idea of the um, sensory details, the precise words, and some of the other description that you will want to include within your narrative. It may be helpful as we go through the Level Up tutorial for you to have your draft in front of you in case you want to make some changes as we work through the activities. In this tutorial, you will learn how to revise by replacing words or phrases. Replace or add transitional words to connect ideas in a passage. Insert sentences to improve organization and clarity. Once you're finished with a piece of writing, it's ready for the world to see, right? Not quite. You should always revise or edit your writing. It is important to revise your writing to be sure that the reader will clearly understand your message. Writing can be revised to make it more interesting, easier to understand, or more convincing. You can revise by taking out, adding, or replacing words, phrases, or sentences in your writing. 
Vivid, specific language makes writing come alive. Dull, overused words should be replaced. Click the terms below to see how the following sentence could be improved with more specific language. The girl has a fast new skateboard. The girl bought a fast new skateboard. The girl bought a fast modern skateboard. Julita bought a fast modern skateboard. Julita bought a modern racing skateboard. To make your writing clear and vivid, avoid unnecessary repetition of words or phrases. Replace repeated and overused words with clear, specific words. Click each phrase below to read examples to the right. Pay attention to how the writing becomes clearer after repeated and overused words are replaced. The day was perfect. Lexi couldn't imagine a more perfect day for a trip to the beach. Lexi and Carl made sure they had plenty of food and sunscreen. Lexi and Carl also made sure they had plenty of water. That was the original text. Now let's take a look at one with repeated and over or the repeated and overused words within the text. We see day, perfect, Lexi. Perfect day, Lexi. Lexi and Carl made sure, plenty of. So now let's replace those words and see how it might change. The weather was perfect. Lexi couldn't imagine a more beautiful day for a trip to the beach. She and Carl made sure they had plenty of food, sunscreen, and water. Notice that by deleting those repetitive words and phrases, we've changed the text to make it more interesting. Precise words help writers create the images they want the reader to see. For example, if you were writing a how-to text, precise words can answer questions that readers might have. Read the paragraphs below about making scrambled eggs. Drag each paragraph to the correct box. Mix eggs and milk. Stir them together and heat them in a pan. Take a second to think about where this should go. Is this using general words or precise words? If you select a general words, you are correct. These directions don't give specific information. How about the next one? Break two eggs in a bowl. Add milk and mix with a fork. Cook in a pan on medium heat. Would that be general or precise? If you selected precise, you're correct. This contains precise words like mix with a fork, cook, and medium. Now the final one. Crack two eggs in a mixing bowl. Add milk and whisk. Cook on medium heat. Is that general or precise? If you selected precise, you're correct. This contains precise words like crack, mixing, whisk, and medium. A pronoun such as he, she, they, it is a word that is used in place of one or more nouns. However, pronouns can be confusing if the reader can't tell which noun the pronoun is replacing. In one of the examples below, the pronouns have been replaced to make the writing clearer. Can you tell which example has been revised for clarity? Example one, the three boys set out hiking in the early morning. They were excited about spotting mountain lions. They had been sighted recently along the trail. And example number two, the three boys set out hiking in the early morning. They were excited about spotting mountain lions. Recently, the big cats had been sighted along the trail. Which example has been revised for clarity using the correct pronouns. If you select example two, you're correct. The pronoun they has been replaced by the big cats to make the sentence clearer. Notice also that the writer used the big cats instead of repeating mountain lions. Make sure to replace cliches or tired overused expressions. They may have begun as imaginative expressions or figures of speech, but have become dull through overuse. Click each sentence below. Notice how the writer replaces each cliche with clear, specific language that gives the reader more information. Instead of using he's free as a bird, you could say he has no weekend plans. Instead of saying the students are busy as bees, you could say the students are working hard. Instead of saying the writing was on the wall, 
you could say she knew what to expect. And instead of saying he tends to cry over spilled milk, you could say he is overly sensitive. Using specific adjectives and adverbs is another way to improve your writing. Adjectives modify or describe nouns and pronouns. Adverbs modify verbs, adjectives, and other adverbs. Slide the ball up and down the scale to see how adding specific adjectives and adverbs can improve a simple paragraph. So this would be an example of a vague paragraph. We hiked up the mountain in the morning. It was cold. The mountain was steep and hard to climb. My backpack was heavy and my feet ached. We reached the peak. The view was really neat. We could see a lot. So there are very few adjectives and adverbs to make that specific. If we want to make it more specific, we could say this. We hiked up the steep mountain in the early morning. It was icy cold. The mountain was very steep and hard to climb. My backpack seemed heavier with each step and my feet ached. At last we reached the peak. The view was awesome. We could see so much. Notice that by adding some of those specific adjectives and adverbs, we're improving the paragraph. And if we want to make it even more specific, we could say this. We began our hike up the steep, rocky mountain in the early morning just after dawn. It was icy cold outside and absolutely quiet. The path was extremely steep and difficult to climb. My backpack seemed heavier with each step and my tired feet ached. At last we reached the peak. The view was spectacular. We could see all around. Notice how that changes the clarity of the paragraph. Precise nouns, verbs, and adjectives can add clearer details. Specific adverbs can tell where, when, how, or how much. Click the words below to see how adding precise words can make the sentence, the dog slept, more interesting. We could add an adjective so that we say, the fluffy old dog slept. Or we could adjust the noun, the fluffy old collie slept. Or we could adjust the verb, the fluffy old collie snored. Or we could add an adverb, the fluffy old collie quietly snored. As this activity will show you, specific adjectives help to create an exact image. It's important to paint a picture for the reader that matches the picture in your mind. Three different situations are presented below. Click each one to see how one adjective can change the impression a sentence makes. So if we have the boys afraid of storms, we could add the adjective terrified. As the rain fell, the terrified boy ran swiftly. If the boy is planning mischief, we could add the adjective naughty. As rain fell, the naughty boy ran swiftly. Or if the boy heard a cry for help, then we could add brave. As rain fell, the brave boy ran swiftly. You've discovered how specific language, nouns, verbs, adjectives, adverbs, can make your writing more interesting and easier to understand. Now, use what you've learned on the previous screens to analyze these three passages. Which one uses the most specific language? The young German Shepherd snipped the ground, trying to pick up a scent. He was their best hope to find the missing child. The dog was ready to go. He would help look for the missing child. The dog smelled the ground. He looked around, too. He was trying to help find the missing child. Which of these is the most specific? If you select the first one, you're correct. This paragraph uses a lot of specific language. Young German Shepherd, Sniffed, and Best Hope. Incorporating sensory details can also improve your writing. As you may know, sensory details tell what something looks, sounds, smells, tastes, or feels like. Drag the ball to see how adding sensory details creates interest and helps the reader visualize the scene. Here's the original paragraph. It was a hot day. I'd already been out in the sun a long time, pulling weeds in the garden. I heard a rattle in the tall grass close by. It was a strange sound. I'd never heard it before, and I wondered what it was. Then I saw it. 
a rattlesnake not far from me, looking right at me. I was so scared. Let's see what happens when we add some sensory details. It was a scorching day. I'd already been out in the blazing sun for hours, pulling weeds in the garden. Sweat poured down my face and into my parched mouth. Suddenly, I heard a sharp rattle in the tall grass close to my foot. It was a strange, clear sound unlike anything I'd ever heard. Then I saw it, a rattlesnake coiled in a heap looking right at me. I was so scared. Notice how we've enhanced our paragraph by adding those sensory details. Let's add a few more. It was a scorching summer day. I'd already been out in the blazing sun since early morning, yanking up weeds in the garden. Dollops of sweat poured down my face and into my parched mouth, adding to my immense thirst. Suddenly, I heard a sharp rattle in the tall grass, inches from my foot. It was a strange, clear sound unlike anything I'd ever heard. Then I saw it, a rattlesnake, coiled in a heap, staring at me. I shivered in spite of the heat and held my breath. I knew that if I moved, it would strike, and it wouldn't miss. So we've made this paragraph even more exciting and more clear and more interesting to read by adding more sensory details. This is like the process of revision. We had an original paragraph, we added a few details, read through it, and saw if we could add some more. Now it's your turn. Be sure to take some time to ensure that the main narrative pieces of your allegory are in place. After all, the main point is to make a political or moral statement through the use of narrative. Hopefully your pre-writing process has prepared you enough for that. Once you feel good about those pieces, use what you've learned in this segment about word choice and description to make further revisions and enhance your storytelling. Before you write your final copy, you will want to look everything over one last time through an editing lens. Look for spelling, grammar, and usage errors. Remember what we learned last week about sentence variety and structure to make sure your writing flows clearly. Once all of that is done, you can write your final draft and you are finished. Good luck, happy revising and editing, and great work.